hi, Dr. Kirsty Scott. It's great to meet you. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're really uh, grateful for your time because I know a lot of our readers are going to be really interested to learn about the incredible science that can support the police in trying to reach the correct conclusions when they're investigating cases like uh, the one that features in the BBC's new series, uh, Body on the Beach. But before we dive into the specifics of those forensics, I was wondering if you could just kind of introduce what it is that you do. Yes, so I am a, uh, I'm a lecturer in forensic biology. Um, I'm based in Liverpool and my route to forensics was an interesting one. So I started out in environmental forensics and I've become uh, a forensic biologist through that. So what I'm interested in is how um, the environment can be used to help us understand different types of crime. So I'm interested in things like soils and pollen and ultimately and primarily interested in diatoms which are a type of algae uh, and how they can be used to uh, diagnose different uh, instances of death or different incidents that might have taken place during uh, crime events. Amazing and outside of forensics what is it that diatoms are about? So diatoms <clears throat> their scientific um, definition I suppose would be eukaryotic microscopic algae um, and um, to the non kind of scientist they're almost golden brown algae so when you're around uh, any kind of body of water or any kind of damp surface like soils or tree bark or things like that more often than not there'll be these microscopic communities of, of algae growing um, and dominating those environments and that's what diatoms are so there are hundreds of different thousands of species. They're characterized by a silica cell wall, so they're really resistant. We find diatoms from tens of thousands of years ago in sediments, uh, so we can use them to understand what the climate was like so long ago because of this resistance. Um, and those different species are specific to different environments and different habitats and different locations. So we can understand, for example, the level of pollution within the water. We can understand um, whether or not um, people are illegally disposing of waste um, products within the water. Uh, we can look at lots of different variables to see, or we can look at the diatom, sorry, to understand how different variables impact the environment um, because they're so diverse and they're also so transient so they 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 change i suppose their communities when exposed to different conditions so they can give us lots of useful information about the environment yeah it's incredible to hear it's incredible to hear how much info can be locked into these tiny little things and that's why they have such a sort of starring role almost in this new documentary series um it comes to the case of annie boyesson um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how it is that they're relevant to this specific case. Yes, yeah, so um, Annie was, um, her body was found in the water uh, or on a beach, I suppose. Um, so immediately when you have any kind of death around water, um, as somebody that's interested in diatoms and interested in those microscopic components of the water, you would automatically, I suppose, um, think about them in relation to how they can help us to understand death. So um, in a case like Annie's where she was found in the water or around the water in a water environment such as the beach, um, you would expect there to be some form of diatom algae evidence that might be able to help investigators. And that evidence could be external. So if it was on some clothing, for example, it could help us to identify if, if somebody had um, moved her or if somebody had, had moved a body or been involved in a crime on the beach you would get diatoms on their clothing but if you don't have a suspect you just have victims you could look at the diatoms that might be present within the internal organs to identify whether or not drowning is the cause of death and more often than not when you find a body in water <clears throat> drowning can be the cause of death it's easy to kind of automatically assume that that might have happened but there are also people out there who might commit a crime, might try and dispose of a body in the water to make it look like um, an accident or to make it look like it might be a type of suicide or something like that. So what diatoms can do, they can give us some really useful circumstantial information to identify whether or not a person was alive before they entered the water. 
So as long as we can look for them within the internal body tissues, they can give us some really useful information. Um, and especially in complex cases or uh, those cases where there isn't any other forensic evidence to lean on. Incredible. And the information that you got for the diatoms in the case of Annie, it really sort of shook up the course of the case. So what did the analysis reveal for her? So to my, I didn't do uh, the diatom analysis for Annie's case, but to my understanding, um, it was only done about eight years after, um, about eight years after her body was found from um, tissue samples, which had been collected at the initial autopsy. And from my understanding, there were two diatoms which were identified in Annie's bone marrow. <clears throat> and the bone marrow is a really good place to look for diatoms because there's less chance for contamination. So that's a really positive site to, to try and look for them and a positive sign in Annie's case to support drowning as the cause of death. But there were only two of them. So it's a very small sample in the first instance. And the other thing that was interesting was that the two diatoms that were found were this species called Navicula lanceolata. And um, that species of diatom is a freshwater, is typically a freshwater diatom. So it's usually found in rivers or lakes. It's fairly common in those environments, but the fact that Annie was found in a marine environment, the beach, um, it suggests, well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting observation. It suggests that either um, she might have drowned in fresh water and her body might have been transported either by currents or uh, by some kind of action, or they could just be in her bone marrow anyway, and they could not point to drowning as the cause of death. So there is the potential for um, diatoms to enter the body in other ways. Uh, so when we have such small numbers, we always have to interpret those with caution. Yeah, I can imagine. It seems like such a delicate science. Um, what else have, have diatoms been able to help us discover in the field of forensics? Yeah, it's really, um, it is really, um, is a, like you say, it's a delicate science because a lot of the time you're dealing with quite large samples and very small numbers. So if you have, for example, a five gram sample of tissue and you only find two diatoms in there, it requires really careful interpretation. So from a drowning perspective, the use of diatoms is the most frequent forensic application of them, but it is also the one that's slightly more controversial because there are so many questions to answer and so many uncertainties because obviously no one was there at the time of death. <clears throat> In terms of their other applications, there's been quite a lot of um, research recently and also a case, I think, in the UK where they were used in a prosecution against animal cruelty. So we're using them in veterinary cases, for example. I think um, the RSPCA used them in 2019. And um, it's just using the same principles of human pathology, but applying them to animals. So they could be really useful, both in domestic cases of animal cruelty or in wildlife forensics as well to understand the cause of death. And then the other application, which is something that I'm primarily interested in is their use as a form of trace evidence. So what that means is we have this kind of concept in forensics of every contact leaves a trace. So what it means is if you or I or a criminal or a suspect is walking through an environment, they leave traces of themselves behind. So DNA, fingerprints and so on. <clears throat> but they also take traces of that environment away with them. So the soil on their shoes, the pollen on their clothes, and also diatoms on their clothing and their shoes as well. So if somebody's been committing a crime in or around water, they'll often have diatoms attached to their possessions that have transferred as a form of evidence. So what I'm really interested in is trying to collect those diatoms from people's clothing, from people's shoes, from vehicles and so on, and trying to figure out if they've had contact with an environment that we know about. So we've we know that this environment is relevant because we found evidence here and also to try and identify an unknown environment because sometimes we don't know where the evidence is and we have to go and find it. And diatoms can be really useful for that because they have these different tolerances for different conditions. 
So if we can look at a sample and say, this has come from fresh water, it's come from a lake, it's come from one that's relatively polluted in an urban environment, then that can narrow down where we're looking for um, forensic evidence, which is really useful. So most of their forensic application has been used in, in those instances. Um, there's also lots of research going on in those different areas too, and that's really helpful because it increases our potential to use it in uh, criminal investigations. We need that research in order for things to be legally admissible in court. <clears throat> so there's lots of research that's been done within diatoms and drowning. So looking at the variables that might impact where diatoms can be found uh, within the body. And there's also lots of research looking into um, those different elements that I was just mentioning. So veterinary um, studies on pathology, <clears throat> trace evidence analysis, and also using diatoms and algae to try and understand the time since death as well. So how long somebody might have been in the water for before they've been found uh, later on and so on. But it's really tricky when you have any crime involving water because it's so diverse and it's so um, transient. It changes constantly. Uh, it can be very, very difficult to identify and to use forensic evidence. And that's where diatoms become really valuable um, in crime science. Yeah, I think it's amazing because it, it, it's quite a niche area of science. But I think it's really great that you're giving people a, an opportunity to learn about it because it's got so many applications as you say that you never know when actually it could it could really help to understand this stuff and it's a part of life that not many of us get a an insight into exactly and outside of the forensic area as well there's lots of work being done to try and harvest diatoms for different things so they produce oxygen for example so we can try and use them to tackle climate change um, there's people exploring the potential to use them within biotechnology because they have these resistant silica cell structures. Um, we're interested in them from a health perspective. We use them as supplements sometimes. You can buy algae as uh, diet supplements and so on. So there's so many different areas of, of science more generally, as well as the forensics, where diatoms are becoming really useful um, if they weren't already. So, yeah, I, uh, I'm a big fan of them, obviously. I can see why it must be a really cool area of research to be involved in and I'm also curious to know like what is an average day in your job like? Yeah so every day is different um, and that's because well, it's primarily because I'm based uh, in a university so I'm more interested or more not more interested but I tend to do more research than I do casework but I have helped um, with um, some different inquiries that are ongoing. So there are different things that I do. Sometimes I am teaching, so I might have lecture theatres where I'm trying to share my enthusiasm for diatoms with uh, students. Other times uh, I might be in the lab doing research. So at the moment I have a, an MSc student and she's doing some really interesting research in marine diatoms. So looking at different marine environments and trying to identify the forensic uses of diatoms in those environments. So I might be in the lab with her, looking at them under the microscope or um, doing some DNA work because well, that's another area of my research that we're hoping to try and advance to improve our ability to detect and identify diatom species. We do a lot of field work as well. So it might be going out into the field. It could be um, going collecting water samples, going collecting some forensic samples as well and taking those back to be analysed later. So every day is different, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and sometimes you get random um, emails about uh, series and things like that and people wanting your opinion on different things. So it's always, um, it's always interesting when you have a niche area of expertise. Um, it's always interesting to see what, how that might interest different people and how you can share that message. So that's one of the reasons I'm grateful for this interview. Yeah, I think uh, consultancy is a, a cool area for research because you never know when, a, you know, a TV series, say, is going to reach out. So yeah. uh, how was it that you came to be involved specifically with Body on the Beach and what was it like working on that show? Yeah, so um, I had actually never heard of Annie's case. Um, it was only when I was contacted that I did a, a deep, dark internet dive and learned a lot more about it. 
Um, so I was contacted by one of the producers from um, Rogan Productions and um, they kind of gave me a brief kind of overview and we had a chat over, um, over Teams and learned a little bit more about it. And then basically um, they asked me, they said, if we collect some samples from Prestwick and we, we come down to you in Liverpool, could you have a look at them and see, see what kind of things you'd be expecting? So I love an opportunity to look down the microscope. So I was very happy to do that. So yeah, they basically went out sampling. Um, they brought those samples down to Liverpool. We had a look at them. We prepared them in the lab using um, the different processes that we might use to prepare uh, biological specimens. And we looked at them under the microscope and um, we did identify some differences. So I can share with you um, in fact, I don't know if you were to do that now, but I can share with you what Navicula lanceolata looks like as a diatom species. And then I can show you one of the species that we found in, um, one of the species that we found in um, Prestwick Beach, for example. So you can even from a, a broad kind of look at it, you can see some differences. So I will just share that very quickly. So hopefully you can see my screen. But this is um, one of the diatoms from Prestwick Beach um, here. So um, it's a species called um, Cochineus, I think. And um, it's a very, you see it's, it's kind of rounded um, as a diatom and it's very resistant. We find it in saline environments. It's adapted to survive in those environments. So finding it on the Prestwick Beach sample wasn't um, wasn't surprising. Um, it's a very common uh, species that we might find. So these samples were brought to me uh, by the producers and the director and we had a look at them in the lab using the microscope. Um, and then I also had this sample here um, and these elongated uh, diatoms that we can see, these are from a freshwater sample which was collected in um, Hertfordshire. So this is from a river, this is Navicula lanceolata. It's, um, as I said, it's a very common diatom but it's not typically found in saline environments. So it's not typically found in marine samples. Uh, so finding that in Annie's um, bone marrow uh, was interesting. Um, it definitely adds complexity to the case and to the interpretation of the diatom evidence. So um, even just from a very broad uh, look at it, you can see those differences uh, with the navicula and with the um, cochineus species as well. Yeah, it's a very uh, stark contrast. You can really see that they're not the same. Yes, I know. It's, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, that was an amazing insight into uh, the science that you share on the show. And I know a lot of people are going to learn a lot from it. Um, thank you so much for your time. And it was great to catch up with you. Thank you so much, Rachel.